My name's Dale, and welcome back to Metal Tips and Tricks. This is part two of how to buy a metal lathe. In the first one, I covered how to uh, analyze the bed and what shape it is. I talked about the tailstock. I talked about this whole area, the apron and the cross slide. So now we're going to continue with the rest of the lathe and this part back here. Let's move on to the chuck and examine that. One of the things you're going to want to do is, if it's three jaw or four jaw, it doesn't matter, you're going to want to check both of them. Is there a lot of play in the, in the jaws themselves? Are they worn out at all? Are you going to have to regrind it? Remember, anytime you find a problem, notate it, and it makes the seller a little more nervous and a little more concerned and inspires him to sell it for a cheaper price. So let's take the chuck off. This has a, what's called a D3 mount, and it has three pins that mount into here, and by tightening cams, it pulls it in. Well, also, when it pulls it in, something else happens if the chucks aren't cleaned out in here, like this one is right now, is those shavings get embedded into this surface, and these surfaces have to match up ident identically. And to regrind these, well, let's just say, it's not an easy task to regrind these, and it's not something I would want to try to do. So if this is badly damaged and dinged up, to me, you really have to be careful and consider walking away from the machine. You'll also want to check the inside spindle bore here. Make sure it's not all rusty or pitty. Now some of you will go, well, what do you need that for? I never put anything in there. Well, some of us do. <clears throat> I've got a C5 collet that holder that goes in here. I also have a center that goes in here that I use from time to time. So you do want to make sure that's in good condition. Also, there may be a time that you want to sell this machine and somebody else watched my video and, well, is going to hold you accountable. So uh, remember, there's a two-edged sword out there. So let's put the chuck back on. We want to make sure that the chuck is running fairly true. The thing is, is it consistent? That's the real question. So let's get back to our indicator. Go to simply set the indicator up and just spin it, see how it does. This one here is giving me a fluctuation of about a thousandth, which is excellent. Let's loosen it up, rotate the bar, see what happens. So we're about two thousandths there. Loosen it up, rotate it. Now this bar is not in great shape, so we can give quite an allowance there. And that's going to be fine. We yeah. want to check the force this way. Now some of you are going to think, well, it doesn't matter. Um, there's thrust bearings in here that press up against it. I got my tail stock that pushes up against it and lines everything out. Well, a lot of time you're not using your tail stock. So if this has a lot of slop this way, it's going to cause you some problems. So let's look at this. This one is zero. What's great about a newer head like this is there a Timken bearing or a tapered bearing. So you're able to put them together with great tolerances. If this were um, a lathe with a bushing on it or a Babbitt bearing, well, things kind of change. If you got a thousandths in and out, you're doing really good. So let's check the top here. Now we want to see how much movement is in on the lateral this way. Excellent. So the bearings, everything checks out great here. Now it's time to look at the transmission that drives the head and changes changes the speed. Now this one here is a gear head. The advantage to a gear head is they're usually quieter, they're easier to change, and they have a better transference of power from the motor to here. Belts can be very inefficient and burn up a lot of your energy. This one here is a six, has six speeds, or I should say six gear changes here for a total of nine different speeds and then I can go back on the motor, step it over so I can get another 9 speed. So this will give me a total of 18 speeds. One of the challenges with this particular metal lathe is 
the ratios or the different speeds don't, how do I want to say, fit together well. Like um, I can go from 90 to 240, it's kind of a large jump, then I can go from 240 to 260, which really isn't a different in speed. So I would say this isn't a very well designed transmission, but it still works quite well. Challenges with transmission is there's a lot of gears inside here. And as we run a speed test on it, we want to be very cognizant of hearing grinding or clicking sounds. Now when you open up the top of this, you'll look inside and you'll manually rotate this and you're going to look at every gear inside here and study each tooth. You're going to make sure there's no teeth missing or any strange marks that would say there's a problem. And also as you're rotating it manually, listen for it. Change the gears here, see how they change. Got a little grind here. That grind is actually because it's not engaged correctly. All these are flat tooth gears, so they don't mesh really well. You just have to be aware that if it doesn't go into gear, you just have to rotate until the gears come together and don't hit on top of each other. A visual inspection here is really important. The other thing is a magnet on a stick. So this is bathed in oil. So there's a, a puddle of oil in the bottom. And as this is running, it splashes up and feeds the oil well. That oil can hide some secrets for you that you want to discover. And you simply want to take a magnet, run it in the oil, go into every corner, every space, look at the end and see what's on there. There may be a missing tooth. There may be a lot of metal, something you want to be aware of. There will always be, you know, some sort of metal filings in there. But if there's big chunks, we might have a problem. So you want to be careful. If there's a tooth missing in here, you know, I would say walk away from the machine. Let's say somebody's asking $1,000 for this. And I find a tooth in there that's missing. And you can hear it clicking when you run it. To replace that gear would take several days to take this apart, put it back together again. And there's no guarantee you can buy a gear. You'd, have to, you'd probably have to manufacture one. Well, that ends up being a lot of work. And you know, if some guy, if I found a broken tooth in there and he asked $1,000 for it and lowered it down to $500, I still might walk away from the machine. I don't know. It would matter how bad it is just because of the complications of getting in there and getting back out. If we were to look at the closing lathe over there, its transmission is so incredibly complicated that I would never even attempt taking it apart, at least not today. So let's talk about this a little bit. Run it through every gear change with the motor running. And one thing I haven't talked about, if you can't plug the lathe in to test it, that drops the price in half for me. You don't want to take a risk because a motor being burned out isn't a big deal. It's, you know, I can buy motors for next to nothing. But when you attach the motor to it, it will help you diagnose if this machine is healthy. And I wouldn't even want to get near it. I mean, I go through all this manually, but to actually hear it run at the different speeds, the low speeds and the high speeds, will help you, you know, figure out what else is wrong. There's also another lever here. This one changes the rotation for when it transfers this shaft down into these so you can change the direction of those so it feeds the carriage either left or right or in or out. And that's where that happens there. So that's all up in this area. So let's go down into where all the gear changing is and talk about what can happen here and how to study it and make sure that it's working properly. As we advance through evaluating our metal lathe, we now get to the gear, quick change gearbox. Now, this is a personal preference of mine. I will not buy a lathe unless it has a quick change gearbox. The reason is they just work so well, they're so efficient, and I'm kind of lazy. I don't want to have to figure out what gears I need for different things. And you end up using them not really about, it's not about threading, but it's about feeding um, your cutter through your material at, at the correct rates. And when you have a quick change gear post or a gear box, it's just much easier to experiment and explore different options. And at the end of the day, this doesn't cost 
that much more on the lathe, you know, it's, it doesn't, how do I want to say, it doesn't change the price that much whether it has it or not. So just buy one with it, wait until you get it. But if you don't take my advice on that, make sure that the stack of gears that come with it is complete. And you'll have to do that by finding different literature on it. Another way is you can just look at it because when you stack up the gears, they'll cone up like a Christmas tree. And if there's one missing, you'll, cut, you'll see there'll be a different size in there and know it's not right. So this quick change gear post, or gear post, this quick change gear box actually is broken down into two sections. There is an A, B, C, D, E section. This is for very coarse settings. And then you have one through eight, and that's for fine settings. So it kind of fills in those little gaps. So that means there's a lot of gears in here and the potential for a lot of damage. So you want to inspect it very closely. You want to run it through every possible combination that is available. And literally, well I shouldn't say not every combination, but you want to run it through all eight of these gears and all five of these gears to make sure there, you're not hearing any clicking or any grinding. Again, clicking means there's probably a bad tooth. If there's grinding, that means there's something out of alignment. Also, you want to make sure that these brackets are straight. Sometimes these machines get hit by something or tipped over, and that's going to show you some evidence there. Also, these handles need to be straight and turning correctly because at any time these can get damaged, of course, by the machine falling over. Another piece of advice I want to give you guys when moving a lathe is I remove all handles and the tail stock and the compound rest when moving a lathe just to prevent them from getting damaged. It also takes some of the weight off the machine, making it easier to move around. Now you've done a inspection that you can outside here. Now you want to look up underneath here with like an inspection mirror. Get under here and look around and see what there is. If you don't have a mirror you can get up under here, look underneath. But my favorite is just to go to my phone and reach it up under here. Now if you want to, you can take pictures, look at the picture, zoom in on it, you can analyze the different gears, whatever you have, very easily. But remember, you need to still rotate it, go through the gears, see what happens. This here, this lever, changes from the top lead screw to the drive shaft down here. And you'll want to try that in the different positions and hear how it sounds here. This will reverse everything. You'll want to hear some of this stuff in reverse. But the real key is to make sure there's no missing gears. So let's come around here to the side. That gear's on the side here. Very accessible. What's great about this side, it's very accessible. If a gear is broken or worn, they're easy to replace. Make sure that the gears aren't fitting too tight. A little bit of movement to the gears in here. If they're too tight, they make too much noise and they wear out quickly. So again, just be aware of that. There's a motor on this side. Look at the motor. Is it clean? Is it dirty? What kind of shape is it in? Also check the horsepower of the motor. A lathe this size should be running at least a one horse motor at very minimum. This one here is set up for a two. If it had like a five horse motor on it, I'd be very, very concerned because that's way too much motor for this small little lathe. The V-belts aren't designed for it, and especially the gears and the shafting inside is not designed for that big a motor. So I'd be very leery, and I would double check everything again if I discovered it was a five horse motor on this size lathe. This one here, I'd go up to a three horse, and it should be okay. Also, look at the V-belts. Not a big deal, easy to replace, but it's just something to know about. Check the condition of the pulleys. Are the pulleys in good shape? Okay, are they cracked? Do they have a chip in them? Do they show any signs of wear? Are they just cheap, you know, cast pot metal? Or are they cast steel that have been turned like these are? Excellent 
something else is to make sure that the pulleys are attached to their shafts and they're not wobbling around any. If they're wobbling around at all, boring out a pulley is no big deal, but replacing a shaft or repairing a shaft really is. And I'll tell you, a repair like that takes $100 right off a lathe for me because I know I've done it several times and it's a real headache. And if you have to rebuild the shaft on the motor, it's, it's kind of a done deal. You know, you might as well throw the motor away unless you've got, unless you've got a way to put it into a lathe because if you take that motor off and put that shaft, that arbor, in this lathe, what's going to drive this? You're going to have to switch motors around. So it's kind of a headache. Um, let's now, let me take you over to a table full of tooling that I think should come with a lathe. One of the fun things about buying a lathe is discovering tooling that comes along with it. And tooling is one of those funny things is it really doesn't add that much value to a lathe, but if it has it, it should make it more valuable to you. Because if you have to buy any of this stuff separate from the lathe, it's going to cost quite a bit of money. But it is just one of those little funny side notes. And when we're talking about tooling, tooling is anything that you add to the machine that adds functionality to it. So like a three-jaw chuck or a four-jaw chuck, that is tooling that adds functionality to it. If I could only have one chuck, of course, it would be a four-jaw chuck because you can do more accurate stuff with it. Another thing you can get is a 5C collet adapter, and this one simply fits in. You take the chuck off. This cone fits in the main shaft. This goes on the, all the way through the shaft, screws onto the collet, pulls the collet in, so it works that way. Another piece of tooling you want to look for are different types of centers. We have live centers, you know, dead centers which don't rotate. You can see this one here has been well, well used. And you want to look at the quality of them. You know, I really hate cheap centers. You can buy them, you know, on eBay for $15, but you do really get what you pay for. And when you think about how much stress is applied to one of these, you really don't want to trust a cheap one on a very expensive piece of metal or a part that you're working on. Another thing is you're going to want is some sort of drill chuck. Now a lot of lathes will end up coming with a lantern tool post like this and they'll have different arms with them. These are not my favorite but you do want a lathe that has one because there are times that I get into a part where a traditional Aloris tool post like this just is too big to get in to certain areas. So they do have value. Also, you end up getting a box of rusty uh, cutters. You always want to take those whatever you can. Very important. Here's a benefit is I've got a steady rest. Um, this one here runs on brass, not my favorite, I'd rather have bearings. This one here is also, doesn't run a very large diameter, so it's kind of a drawback with the design of this lathe. Another great piece of tooling is what's called a follow rest. And the follow rest actually attaches right onto your carriage and helps you actually, had it backwards, backwards, attaches onto your carriage and helps you stabilize smaller pieces. We also have a face plate that came of this lathe. So this lathe came really well tooled and this, the back story on the Senko lathe is kind of fun. You know, we look at Craigslist and if it doesn't show a picture and doesn't have a great description, we kind of ignore it. Well, I gotta tell you guys, that's where my best deals come from. This here, the ad just said, Entco metal lathe and no photograph. So I call the guy up and he tells me about the lathe. And what it was, it was in a bakery. And it was a small bakery that had to have repairs done to machinery. But they had a machine shop nearby that they'd take things to during the weekday and the weekend, or I should say on Saturdays. But on Sundays, the, the machine shop was closed, so they would hire a machinist to come in and fix things. And that's what the lathe was there for. They also had a milling machine. Well, it almost 
never, ever got used. This thing still had, and probably still has, Cosmoline on a couple of the parts that I don't use it very often. And it was just one of those great ads for $500. I never even plugged the thing in. I just bought it. I bought it sight unseen, drove down there as fast as I could, handed him my money, put it in the back of the truck, and drove home. And it came with all this tooling. And it was just one of those great opportunities. I call this, na I call this lathe my baker's lathe because it came out of a bakery. Well, there we go. That's kind of a great background of how to buy a metal lathe. You want to have tooling, you want to make sure it has some tooling with it. You want to make sure you bring tools with you and cleaning supplies so you can inspect the machine. You want to detail, go through the entire machine, operate every lever, check every gear. Be careful during this time. A good inspection for me takes about an hour if there's easy access to the lathe. Sometimes they're hiding in a back corner someplace, in a dark place. So remember to bring an extra flashlight or two. Don't forget to bring your phone. You can take pictures of it. Also, go to the websites. Go to vintagemachinery.org and find out information. When you talk to the guy on the phone, find out exactly all the information he has on the lathe, like what's the serial number? There's always a serial number on the bed. Who's it made by? All that stuff. Do that research up front before you get there. Also, print out any manuals you can find. Another great source, which I also like, is lathe.co.uk. He also has some wonderful resources and a lot of back history on metal lathes. So those are two really great resources. Also, some friends you can call up and go that way. So there we are in a nutshell. That's how I inspect a lathe. Now, don't send me any questions about what is my favorite lathe or what lathe would I buy or what lathe should I buy. I don't have a clue, okay? I just buy things I find that are great deals, and I make that same suggestion to you. It's better to buy a lathe and learn about it and sell it and buy another one than it is not to own a lathe at all. All right, guys, until next time, go out in your shop or check Craigslist and buy something cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm.